Welcome. Welcome to Acts of Magis. This is one way the Loyola Schools tries to celebrate grace. Grace, even in the face of adversity. I'd like to thank the Loyola Schools faculty members who are going to do their presentations. They are commendable in their own excellence, expertise, and passion for the common good. I'd also like to thank the University Research Council and the Ateneo Research Institute of Science and Engineering for collaborating in organizing this event. So welcome again, go with hope and courage. Dr. Maria Mercedes T. Rodrigo is a familiar face in the Department of Information Systems and Computer Science. Known for giving service in the form of pedagogy and research, Dr. Rodrigo contributes to the community in ways that reflect her passion for education and learning. She is a full professor, the head of the Ateneo Laboratory for the Learning Sciences, and currently the executive director of Arete. Despite these responsibilities, she also manages the Ateneo Programming Varsity Team, or PROGVAR, a team of students who have consistently earned accolades in programming competitions in both local and international events. As accolades go, Dr. Rodrigo is no stranger to awards, as she has been earning them through her years of service. The spectrum of her achievements is broad. These range from winning first runner-up for the regional winners of the 2010 CHED Best Higher Education Institution Research Program Awards, an award given to her and the effective computing group of her research lab, to a special citation for the Best Book in Children Category Award in the 12th Cardinal Sin Catholic Book Awards for her book entitled Cave Dweller, a story about Jane Nunez. Well trusted by the community, Dr. Rodrigo was the regional contest director for the ICPC Asia Manila 2017 and 2019, the leading intercollegiate international programming competition, and the local organizing chair for ICCE 2018, a conference emphasizing what Dr. Rodrigo is passionate about, computer science and education. One would think that all of these achievements may have allowed her teaching to take a step back. But on the contrary, researching about education and learning did not halt her from dispensing them admirably. It is therefore no surprise that she is the recipient of the 2017 to 2018 ASPAC Award for Outstanding Teachers and Moderators in the Loyola Schools for the Outstanding Full-Time Teacher category. The list goes on, but this is only the introduction. The floor is now given to the one who deserves to be called a teacher. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Maria Mercedes T. Rodrigo. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Act of Magic, Athenian in the Service of Society. We're happy to have you with us again for this session, and as you have seen, our guest is Ms. Rodrigo Mandelis. How are you? Hi, Chris. Good afternoon. I'm good. You? How are you? Good. I'm good, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're, of course, we're very excited to hear more from ma'am Davis, and so just some housekeeping matters. Uh, we'd like to request all our audience members keep your microphones on mute. And if you may also please turn off your cameras for the duration of the program. And the program is being brought to you live on two platforms. We have this on Gmi, where we can have some chat questions later on in the program. And we're also streaming live via FD and the Ateneo Facebook account. So our friends who are tuned in to FD may also post their questions in the comments sections, and we'll pick them up later and then share them with Mam. And before we begin, we'd like to again thank, of course, the University Research Council and the Ateneo Research Institute of Science and Engineering. And so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, this is Act of Magis featuring Dr. Dibe Rodrigo. All right. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon again, and the title of my talk today is What AI Tells Us About How We Learn. Um, I wanted to say this is the uh, this is a summary of some of the work that we do in my lab um, on the use of artificial intelligence in education. Uh, the COVID-19, let's start with the with our context right now. The COVID-19 pandemic has had an impact on 1.4 billion learners. So all these learners have been affected by school closures worldwide. And the 
uh, here in the Philippines as in other countries, the challenge is to go digital. If people are to uh, continue studying, if we want academic continuity, then schools, colleges, universities have no choice but to go online. Um, we, we're all actually, even as I speak, uh, people in the Loyola schools, in the grade school, the high schools, we're all training to, to learn how to teach online. We are undergoing, uh, we're undergoing a training course on adaptive design for learning. Um, and I've also seen on, on social media that uh, many other universities are providing similar training to, to their own faculty as well as to anybody who who would like to, to learn and who needs to learn. Um, and so the question that I, uh, I, I kind of pose today uh, to frame my talk is, can AI, artificial intelligence, help in this context? Um, and the short answer, the short answer to that question is yes. However, it is complicated. It's not, it's not quite that simple. I am going to focus today on an area of artificial intelligence called learning analytics. And uh, if you've heard of big data, if you've heard of uh, business intelligence and machine learning, this is exactly the same thing. It's, learn it's, it's the use of statistical and data mining methods to uh, learn about something. It, in this particular case, that something is is learners. We look at educational data in order to gain insight about the people whom we teach, the people whom we serve as educators. The um, learning analytics process is, is quite lengthy and um, it begins with data collection. You, you, you get your data from multiple streams. It could be, uh, it could be human observations, maybe um, the thoughts of the teacher as she as she sees her, her students in the classroom. Uh, it could be uh, transcripts or, or transaction logs as students work with computer-based um, uh, learning tools or learning environments. It could be biometrics. You could you could put let's say a heart sensor, a heart rate sensor, on a student to check if they are nervous while doing a presentation or something of that sort. There are many streams of data. It could also be social media. You can collect from Twitter, from Facebook, and other, uh, other social, me social media outlets um, to see how students are feeling, what they're thinking, what their concerns are, and so on. So that's, that's the start, data collection. Um, now, you, you take that data, you pre-process it. You have to get rid of all the junk, you, the, the, the anomalous transactions. You summarize it, and then you, you later on, when you, you've gotten it to a point where it's, where it's somewhat refined, then you move on to the data modeling. And this is, this is where you apply statistical methods, uh, data mining methods, and, and other, uh, uh, you can do fancy things like deep learning. Deep learning is a very big um, this is where you apply all of those all of those different methods. Then you you present your results, and then oh, ideally ideally those results will lead to some kind of intervention, a change in the way we teach, maybe a change in the way we build our software, so that um, so that we improve the learning situation overall. We we make students more engaged, more more motivated. Um, we provide a more gentler, a more humane, sorry, did I just say a more gentler? A gentler, a gentler, more humane uh, learning environment. Okay, so that's um, that's the process. And, and of course, it assumes that students have computers. It assumes that students um, have software that can actually capture all of this data. Um, there, and, and that, I know, is a contestable assumption. Um, but this is the only slide that I'm going to share that talks about uh, about the process of data mining, because we can go on and on about this. We have um, you you can study this for years, and uh, and and some people among my colleagues and I have done 
So, so uh, I, I, this is not something that I can fully unpack in a 20 minute presentation. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the insights that, that my lab has actually uh, been able to, uh, to, to find in the work that we've done. Um, the, the, the laboratory that I have is called the Ateneo Lab for the Learning Sciences. And one of the things that we do is engage in learning analytics. Okay. Um, the learning analytics, we, we, have, um, we have, actually we started our practice in learning analytics back in 2007, thereabouts. So we've been at this for a while and we've grown, we've learned. Um, we started very simply back in 2007. We did some basic, um, some basic statistical analysis. And as we've gone along, we've, we've uh, gotten more and more, uh, um, more and more, I want to say sophisticated, or we've learned a lot. Um, I, I can't pretend to be, uh, to be truly an expert in this field just because it keeps growing and growing and growing. And just when you think you understand something, um, there's more to learn. So you you always feel like a neophyte. The um, paper today is work that we have we have done, insights that we have arrived at, and and let's see, let's see. Hopefully, some of these things resonate with you. Okay, um, I've picked out a few things that we've studied. Um, these, these are wheel spinning, carelessness, code switching, incubation effect, collaboration, and visitor patterns. Okay. And I will talk about each one in turn. Um, I will go kind of straight to the, to the um, I, I'll introduce the concept of what each of these phenomena uh, is. And then I'll go into what we've been able to, to gather about them. Um, I will not take you through the data set, how we got through the, the how we got the, how we collected the data, analyzed it, and so on, just because it will take too much time. Um, if you'd like the details, uh, we, I can link you to to the work that we've done, and um, and we and of course, if you have questions about this later on, we can. Um, you please feel free to write me. I have again, my contact information will be at the end. All right, first, let's talk about wheel spinning. Um, wheel spinning is defined as the failure to master a topic despite effort. Um, and this is work that, that I, I started back in, I would say five or six years ago with Dr. Joseph Beck of the WPI. Um, let, me, let me dwell a little on the definition. The failure to master a topic despite effort. I think we've kind of all been there, right? Um, we've, we've, uh, you know, your, your, your math teacher explains something and you're given a problem to solve and you try and you fail and you try again and you fail and you try again and you fail. You're trying, you're trying, but but you're not quite getting it. Or let's say you were given a reading. Um, this, you're given a reading. Um, you go, you, you, you read and you're not quite sure you get it. So you read it again. And you're still not sure you get it. So you read it the third time, and you're still not sure you get it. So you you fail to to reach this level where you are, um, where you can say that you understand, or you can say that you have mastered the skill. So let me give you a few situations. So let's suppose that uh, we have a student here who was given uh, for for the la for lack of uh, just for simplicity's sake, let's say that he was given a math problem, and um, let's say the competency that, that he is supposed to uh, to show is addition of single digit numbers. So four plus three, uh, five plus seven. It's a simple, simple uh, addition of single digit numbers. Um, and each attempt is a different problem, but it's the same skill. So maybe this first attempt is five plus three and this second attempt is uh, two plus four and this third attempt is one plus eight or something. But it, it's all kind of the same skill. It's just that um, it's different representations of the same skill. Okay, and this is our this is our student. So he gets the first problem, he gets it correct. He gets the second problem, he gets it correct. 
third problem, fourth problem, both correct. Fifth problem makes a mistake. Sixth problem gets it correct. So given this profile, and please uh, just type in the chat box um, if you if if you can uh, if you have access to the to the chat box. Do you think this student has mastered the skill of adding two single digit numbers? So just say yes or no. And we will give you a little time. Okay, one person said no. <laughs> Anyone else? Any other opinions? So, if this were to um, okay, Winfrey says yes. Um, no. 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 <laughs> um, so, if this were if this were a test, uh, the student would have gotten uh, five correct out of six. That's probably a passing grade already. So, so we can say that. In all probability, this, this student understands. Uh, let's look at another profile. Let's say this student here um, got the first attempt correct, a couple of wrong answers, and then got the last three correct. So this is an example of a student who, again, probably will, would have passed the quiz. If this were a six item quiz, you got four out of six, not, not a great score, but puede na siguro. Okay, let's look at the third example. All right, we have a student, student number three. Um, he tries the first, tries the first time, fails. Um, tries the second time, gets it correct. So it looks like there's hope. Then the next four answers are correct. I am sorry, are incorrect. Um, in a case like this, would you say that the student has mastered the topic, has mastered the skill of adding two single digit numbers? So please type in the chat box. Okay, so we have a no. Um, this student here, all right, this student here, student number three, uh, this is an example of wheel spinning. Okay, this is a profile of what the student might look like if he or she were wheel spinning. Um, there is continued effort because you can see that the student tried, uh, keeps trying, keeps trying, go on and on, um, but is not demonstrating mastery despite effort. Um, if you were this student, you were trying, 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 and not succeeding. How would you feel? Again, please type in the chat box. Okay, frustrated, sad, and discouraged. Yes, he said. All right. So you can tell wheel spinning is not a good thing. Wheel spinning is something that can actually be very discouraging for students. The fact that they put in all this effort and it's not that they're not making headway, they're not making uh, their efforts are not being rewarded. Um, and I told you that about thirty percent of our students end up wheel spinning. So the what we have found in the research that we've done is that. Um, this here is the, 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 the lines here are just actually, you can ignore the red line, just look at the blue dot. Um, the blue dotted line shows you the cumulative percentage of students who have achieved mastery. Um, now, the, the x axis shows you the number of practice opportunities the student has had. And you might notice that after about the eighth try, it's like the, the majority of students, maybe about 70% of students, would have mastered the skill by the eighth, ninth, tenth try. And if you look beyond the graph, uh, 
students who practice 11 times, 15 times, 19 times, and so on, never get to master the skill. So there's this spread of 35% or so of our students who are trying, 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 and never achieving mastery. So this is this is an instance of wheel spinning, and it's quite prevalent. This 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 graph actually doesn't stop at 19; it goes on. So there are people who try 21 times, 25 times, and they're still not reaching that level of mastery. So you can imagine that it's um, the amount of frustration. There are 30 percent of our students out there who are truly frustrated with what they're doing because they can't seem to get it. Um, and this is an instance where, um, so what, what does this mean? Okay, does this mean, uh, well, one way to interpret this is that if you don't get it by the eighth or ninth attempt, you should just give up. Okay, <laughs> that's one way to interpret it. But of course, this is not some, this is not an attitude that we want to encourage because we don't want people to give up. Um, the, the better way of interpreting it is if you don't get it, if you don't master the skill by the eighth or ninth attempt, get help. Get help. Ask your teacher. Um, ask, uh, ask a classmate. Get a tutor. Seek out help. Okay. Or uh, an still another way to think about it is from the teacher's side, if you notice that the student is still struggling despite multiple attempts, um, then it's time to intercede. Maybe the approach isn't working for that person. And, and introducing more and more problems maybe isn't going to solve the, the mastery issue. Maybe what needs to be done is, is some form of tutoring, some, a, a different way of presenting the content, um, a worked out example, something else. The strategy isn't working. <clears throat> so this is an, an example of real speaking. Now, okay, this is what this is one of the things we found out. All right, what about carelessness? Carelessness uh, re re refers to making a mistake despite knowing the answer. And again, this is work that we did with uh, Sweet San Pedro, who's currently working for ACT, and Ryan Baker, who's currently with UPenn. Um, let's go back to student number one. Um, one of the things we know this is okay. Student number one. Uh, made a mistake at the fifth attempt. Um, student number one got one to four correct, uh, made a mistake at number five, at attempt number five, and then got number six correct. Now, we can think of attempt number five as a careless mistake because clearly, based on what happened in attempts one to four, the student demonstrated some level of mastery of the topic already. But then for some weird reason, he or she made a mistake in, in attempt number five. So we might think that, okay, maybe that was a careless mistake. Maybe uh, it, it was, uh, they forgot the carry, they forgot to put the negative, something like that. Um, but it, was, it wasn't because they didn't know the answer, it was because they did something thoughtless. Um, what we found out about careless mistakes is that it's the highly engaged students who make errors. These are um, when the, the, the when students are highly engaged and they make mistakes, the make the mistakes that they make usually are careless mistakes. Maybe because they're overconfident, maybe because they get impulsive, uh, maybe because they, you know they don't check their work. I know this. I don't need to. I don't need to look at it again. Um, and therefore, the mistakes become careless. Uh, the students who are confused or bored are the ones who make fewer careless errors because the errors that they do make stem from a genuine lack of knowledge rather than rather than from carelessness. Now, one thing I have to say, um, it doesn't mean that highly engaged students make, uh, make more mistakes. No. Overall, in terms of absolute numbers, the students who are confused or bored are the ones who make more mistakes in terms of absolute numbers. But the types of mistakes that they make tend to be uh, honest mistakes, mistakes born out of genuine lack of knowledge. Um, highly engaged students, the students who are very good, don't make as many mistakes. When they do make mistakes, these are overconfident, impulsive, careless mistakes. So this is what we've learned about carelessness. 
Okay, what about code switching? Um, code switching refers to alternating between languages. So if when you when you uh, lapse into Taglish, when you say uh, when you uh, when kunyare oyan ganyan, parang I go from English to to Filipino. Uh, that's that's code switching. So again, this is work that we did with Evelyn Yerzybinski, Amy Ogan, and Noboru Matsuda. Um, and for this, I need to to uh, to offer some context. The, uh, the the software we were using was software entitled Sim Student, and this uh, this was a math uh, so, uh, a math intelligent tutoring system. Your the, the the human student is supposed to tutor Stacy, the, the little girl here on the lower right uh, corner. Um, Stacy is a robot. Stacy is an intelligent agent who learns by example. You're supposed to provide Stacy with, um, with examples of algebraic equations. You show her how to solve them and she learns based on the examples that you show. Uh, the software was created in Carnegie Mellon University, and we tried it out here in the Philippines. Uh, sometimes Stacy will ask you a question. She'll say something like, um, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do next. Um, or she'll say, uh, why did you decide to use two? Or why are you, um, what am I supposed to learn from this? Why did you choose this example? So she'll, she'll, she'll ask the, the human tutor uh, for, for uh, questions about why, why, why this, why that. And the human tutor is an answer. Now take note, Stacy does not understand what you've typed. It's really just uh, uh, an invitation for the human tutor to, um, uh, to reflect upon the experience. Um, and we notice that what the students type were sometimes in English and sometimes in Filipino. And we were trying to understand why. And so we read all of the, uh, everything that the, that the um, students type, or the human students type. And we found out <coughs> certain things. Uh, first of all, that we, we found out that, that more often than not, uh, the, the use of Filipino was used to express uncertainty. Um, it happened when the when the human student was feeling embarrassed or ashamed. So there was this what's known as face threat reduction. It's it's a way to save face. Um, it was usually they were expressing some kind of frustration with their own knowledge, or they were expressing frustration with their partner, meaning Stacy. But overwhelmingly, the sentiment was negative. When students code switched, when they said things in Filipino rather than English, the sentiment was almost always negative. So what's the implication? If you're going to design uh, an intelligent tutor for a bilingual community or a trilingual community, um, switching language might be an indication of some kind of negative feeling on the part of the student. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's not um, it doesn't necessarily mean, uh, oh, sorry, it, you don't have to design the, the software to understand what was said. All you have to do is, is design it to detect when language is changed. And when language, when language is changed, that might be an indication of, uh, of, of negative emotion, which you might want to address. Okay. Um, Next, let's go to the incubation effect. And the incubation effect is something that was studied by one of my, uh, one of my colleagues, one of my former students, now my colleague, May Talanjan Felipe. She's online today. Hello, May. <laughs> um, th this refers to a, a, the phenomenon where uh, when one gets stuck in a problem, uh, you, you decide to take a break, do something else, Later on, you return to a problem and then you eventually solve it. So that that gap, that taking a break, um, is is known as uh, the, the taking a break and eventually being able to solve the problem is uh, is referred to as the incubation effect. Um, and so 
one of the questions we were trying to confront uh, when May, when May was doing her work was, um, is taking a break always good? Does taking a break end up being positive all the time? Or does it, is it always helpful? Or is it, uh, is it nuanced? Is, does, it, does it depend on certain factors? Um, and what she found, oh sorry, oh, sorry. so one, some context again. The, the software we were using in this case was uh, physics, what was a, was a physics game called Physics Playground. The goal of the game was for you to get this green ball here to the red balloon. And you do that by drawing ramps, uh, springboards, um, pendulums, and, and other, and other uh, possible simple machines uh, to just nudge the ball along. Um, what, what May found out uh, when studying the incubation effect is that um, you are likely to solve a previously unsolved problem if you continue to solve other problems, meaning um, you don't just stop completely, but you, you continue with the, with the problem solving. Uh, and if you continue to solve problems with similar solutions. So you can say like, if, you saw, if, if the solution was a ramp and you continued to, to, to solve problems that required ramp solutions, then um, you're more likely to get that problem which was previously unsolved. Um, there are instances where taking a break will not be helpful. So for example, if you are, um, if you uh, encounter the unsolved problem late in the session, um, and this could be, meaning if you have like let's say an hour to play with the game and you, and you encounter the difficult problem late, uh, maybe the last 15 minutes or so, it's unlikely that taking a break at that point will allow you to solve that problem, even if you get to return to it. Um, it's, uh, you, it's also unlikely that you will solve the problem if you wait too long. So if you encountered it early, let's say the first 10 or 15 minutes of your one hour, and then you return to it in the last 15 minutes, it's not, uh, yeah, you'll probably not be able to solve it. So there is a, there's a certain amount of, um, there's a sweet spot. You, you, you have to return to the problem within some kind of reasonable time. Okay, moving along. Uh, let's talk about collaboration. What did we learn about collaboration? Uh, this is work that we did with, with Maureen Villamore of USEP, Dr. Maureen Villamore. Um, collaboration refers to working together to achieve a common goal. Um, and the context here was, uh, was that we were asking students to collaboratively, uh, sorry, to collaboratively so, um, debug uh, buggy problem. So we gave them a we gave them a computer program which solved the problem, uh, but we deliberately put bugs uh, in the in the code. Uh, these bugs could be syntax errors, they could be logical errors. Uh, the challenge here was to um, have students work together to try to see if they could debug, if they could find the bugs. And what you see here uh, is that we used eye tracking to, to study this problem. We had three computers set up. Uh, each computer had the, um, had the, the, each computer was independent. We put uh, the partners on the two computers in the, in the, uh, on the far right and the far left. Um, and they had to, they had to collaborate with each other using a chat box. And the reason we did that was because um, we wanted to be able to record what they were typing, what they had, so that we could gauge the quality of their of their interaction. Uh, if they were able to talk to each other, then uh, we wouldn't be able to capture it. So anyway, um, they, we used eye tracking so we could see uh, if they were at, how how synchronized their gazes were, and um, and we were trying to qualify sort of the level of um, collaboration, the quality of the lab collaboration. And, okay, so what did we find out? Um, we found out that 
uh, skilled strangers perform the best. Meaning if you have two high performing students who didn't know each other very well, they tended to have the best results. Um, now, the thing is, the best results does not necessarily mean that they work together. They could have worked independently and this just didn't talk to one another. Uh, so maybe in that sense, it wasn't really much of a collaboration. Um, but they did arrive at the answers. They were able to find the bugs. They had the highest scores. So they were, because again, they were high performing students. Now, if you had a, 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 a good student paired off with a student who wasn't uh, wasn't this good? They still tried. Uh, they still managed to perform reasonably well. Uh, they tended to work somewhat separately, but overall, they were still able to to get to the answers. Um, what's interesting here is that if you had a strong student and a weak student paired up, and they were friends, they collaborated quite well. They worked well together, but they had the poorest performance. So it's quite possible that that they really weren't discussing much of the the, the subject matter. Maybe they probably they, they could have been talking about um, things other than the program and the bugs. Um, and this is interesting because um, they it kind of goes to show you that it does it's not always optimal to work with your friends. Okay, so think about it. Um, you you can uh, sometimes we, we allow our students to to choose their own group mates, for example, uh, and 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 students sometimes get a little upset if the if the if the teacher is the one who assigned the groups, but there they, this shows us that there's perhaps some wisdom in assigning groups as opposed to letting people choose their own groups, maybe right? Okay. The last thing I wanted to share with you, and I'm just checking the time, um, is on what we call visitor patterns. And this is work that's being done by Jenna Gapito, Jonathan Casano, who are both with DISCs, and Abigail Moreno, who is an incoming uh, junior. OK. Uh, well, this is work that we're doing with the Ateneo Art Gallery. Um, what we did here was we positioned Bluetooth beacons. Bluetooth beacons are about the size of a one peso coin. Um, you can position them relatively unobtrusively. Uh, you can stick them on walls. Um, and they emit, as you might, as, as the name suggests, a Bluetooth signal. Uh, we position them in various places in the in the art gallery. Uh, if you look at the, the um, figure that I've showed on the screen, um, each separate um, area, so each differently colored area, had a minimum of two beacons uh, in the area. And what we did was when our when visitors went to the museum, we gave them, we lent them a cell phone with a, with a program that could pick up the Bluetooth signal. Um, the, the, the phone that we lent them then just um, recorded where, what beacon they were close to. And based on all that data, we arrived at, at certain uh, analyses. <clears throat> um, like, let, I know this is this is looking very messy, but let me try to uh, explain. The um, um, the the green circles uh, refer to how attractive an exhibit is, and the the, the blue circles around them uh, refer to to how much, um, sorry, let me say that again. The blue circle refers to how attractive something is, and the green circle refers to how, uh, to how much the, how, it's like how long somebody stays in the area, how the, the, the ability of the exhibit to hold the, the visitor as opposed to just attract the visitor. Okay, so uh, exhibit four, exhibit 10, and exhibit uh, sorry, exhibit 11 and exhibit 12, that should be 12, not 10, um, are attractive, but they, uh, and, and they're able to hold the attention of the, of the visitor. Um, in contrast, uh, exhibit number nine is attractive, so people pass by, uh, a lot of people pass by exhibit nine, 
but the fact that the the the, the uh, so you have a strong blue circle, but you don't have a strong green circle, which means that it, the the exhibit nine doesn't hold attention as much as uh, four, eleven, and twelve. Um, in the, you, we also find patterns like this where you have um, exhibit fifteen over here, which is attractive, and people people don't stay, so it doesn't hold people. However, you can see these are, there are lots of these little aqua, uh, aqua circles, which, which um, signifies how near people tend to be. And you see a lot of strong aqua circles, which means a lot of people stay nearby. Uh, and this implies that maybe Exhibit 15 is one of those things that needs to be appreciated from a distance. So it's not something you, you you should look at close up. You should step back a little bit and and just uh, appreciate these things from uh, 15 from afar. Okay, so let's go back to my question. What does AI tell us about how we learn? Um, so AI tells us when students are engaged in non-learning behaviors like wheel spinning, um, students tell, uh, sorry, AI tells us when students are disengaged or care or careless, uh, overconfident, impulsive. Um, AI can tell us if students are frustrated if they code switch. Uh, the AI tells us how effectively we can take breaks. Um, we can by by looking at incubation effects. Um, AI can tell us a little about what combinations of students would lead to better outcomes. And AI can tell us how people interact with interesting surroundings. So um, that is where I'm going to end this. I want to thank Ateneo, of course, for its continuing support. Much of the research that we've done has been made possible by, by the university. Uh, I would like to thank um, the Commission on Higher Education, the Department of Science and Technology, uh, the Private Education and I would like to thank um, all of you for listening today. Um, and now I think we can go to questions. Thank you, ma'am, Didi. Should I stop sharing my screen, please? Um, yes, please, so we can see your, your beautiful face. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So typically at this point of the program, people would be applauding you. But since we can't <laughs> quite get all the audio, uh, this represents all the applause you're getting. Okay. And on Facebook, you are getting a lot of hearts. That's oh, thank thing. you. All right, ma'am. So, well, uh, I'd like to echo what one of our friends said in the chat. It's indeed a very interesting uh, study. You know, it, it validates things that we actually feel as teachers or as educators, but now it's really backed up by, by the science, by the data that we bring together. Um, so perhaps as a starting question, um, can you give us an idea where the data used for these studies were from exactly? How they look like? What oh. large and how large <laughs> is the, the data sets are really to come up with these insights? Okay. Uh, well, the, um, usually when we, um, when we conduct studies, we make use of software that is uh, that's instrumented, and what that basically means is that it uh, it records what the uh, what the student is doing. So you capture, in some cases, keystroke level data, everything that the student types. Um, you record um, the context. In which, uh, in which the student typed the answer. So you know, for example, which problem they were trying to solve, uh, what was the prompt, uh, what the student typed, whether that's correct or wrong, um, and then how the student responded. Uh, the size of these data sets is, is quite large. It's not quite at the level of, um, of the, 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 the terabytes that you can find now, but it's uh, it's in the level of gigabytes also, in the tens of gigabytes. Um, so, for example, you know, the, the eye tracking data is very, very large. It's, it's yeah, it's probably uh, it's good per user. Um, if you include the video, mga, yeah, it's a couple of gigabytes per user for for a one-hour session. 
it's, it's huge. It's big. <laughs> I mean, it's huge for us. It's... Yeah, I could, I could imagine. Now, well, I'd like to take a, a question on that was forwarded earlier. Uh, it cites one of the books that were, was, I think, last year no, released. Everything is F. I cannot say <laughs> the full title, of course. Um, and it talks about innovation as something. It talks about innovation or diversion, uh, where the technology brings those two things. Technology brings either innovation or diversion. So for that, for our audience, uh, it's, the book says that innovation is something that upgrades pain, or it replaces one pain with something that is more tolerable than the previous one. Diversion, on the other hand, is something that avoids or entirely delays the pain. Okay. So, um, an internet definitely is considered one of the greatest innovations and has helped a lot of aspects of human life. Okay. So, uh, at what point would you say is AI more of an innovation or it's leading now towards being a diversion? Oh, that's a good question. Okay. Um, I think the, at, at least in the circles where I tend to work, okay, um, there's definitely ways to use AI for evil. Let me say that. Okay. Uh, in the circles in which I work, we really do try to use it for good. And we, we try to, well, the, the people I tend to work with are people who genuinely care about their students and genuinely care about education as a whole. We're all trying to, to make the educational experience better for our students, um, better meaning more effective, more humane, um, more engaging. And, and so in that sense, we're, we are really trying to innovate in that direction. Um, yeah. And now as a distraction, that's one of the things that we actually try to avoid because we, 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 one of the things we study is whether students are, are bored or off task. And that's not something we want. That is not a place where we want students to be. A boredom is, is actually insidious. It's hard to, to get students out of boredom. So we want to get them out of that. It's, 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 a, it's not desirable at all. <laughs> Frustration, when you're frustrated, you can, there's some energy there to, to resolve the frustration. but. But boredom is hard because you really backed away from from what you're doing. Yeah. And I guess with in our current context, you know, where where a lot of the things we're doing now, especially the learning, will be mm. from home. Yeah. You know, uh, a lot of these factors are at play: boredom, distraction. You know. yeah, yeah. Ma'am, I'll get a question that was forwarded from uh, the, our FB live feed. Okay, this is from Ms. Nath Galia from Central Mindanao University. Thank you for joining us, Ms. <laughs> Galia. As teachers, how can we incorporate the findings of the educational constructs on how we teach now in the online or virtual classes? Oh, okay. Um, some of these insights are actually applicable um, to sort of non-technology context, meaning, meaning uh, okay, the, 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 the problem with some of the work that I do with is that it's very tech heavy. So you need to have the software, you need to have uh, these, these sorts of platforms where, and you have to have your students work with them. But I think there are the, the lessons, some of the lessons can transfer even uh, to the face-to-face. -face. So for example, um, the, the, the thing about wheel spinning, um, I think a teacher who is looking at, at her class or his class um, can kind of tell when, when somebody is, or, or is, is, um, is, is hitting a wall. Uh, so you, you notice that um, So uh, the, the, the solution, at least you know, based on our read, based on what we've done, is not to give them like more problems to solve. But the solution is to intervene in some constructive way. Maybe you have to say, oh, sige, mamaya, um, mamaya 3.30, let's, let's meet online, just the two of us, let's, let's hash this out. 
Let's uh, tell me what you don't understand. Or let me try try to solve this in front of me and tell me, um, and, and let me try to see what your thought process is so that I can tell you why you you can't seem to to get to the right answer. So you you can take it kind of as a cue that um, mm -hmm. that that it's time to switch strategy for for a particular learning, or um, let's say. Um, the the we like our findings. We I didn't present them today, but we had findings about boredom that um, that that I already mentioned. Um, it's it's a very bad state to be in. When a student is bored, it's going to be very hard to get them back. So better that they that you make them frustrated or angry or some other emotion that that has energy. Behind it, rather yeah. than um, than than this very sort of withdrawn, passive mm -hmm. emotion, um, or like ah, we've done some studies on the use of games, and we've se we've seen that, um, uh, and and this maybe ties into the online classroom. We're going, uh, many of us are going to try to really look for games to to mm -hmm. spice up our activities and to make them more interactive. Um, it's important not to overdo it because if you, because the kids will get bored with games also. From games, they'll learn games. They'll, they'll, they'll turn off eventually. So you you know you can play, let them play a little, uh, but we notice after maybe 30 minutes or so, well for one particular game that we used, the the, the boredom really started to spike already. So um, you know, small doses, you know, judicious use, talaga. So I mean it, it's maybe things like that that, that can be distilled. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Before we proceed, this, uh, we're getting actually a lot of questions here, but I'd like to highlight some from the chat. Uh, well, this one's not a question, but a greeting from Doc Marlu. Oh. Uh, it's a very interesting study, technology used in a friendly way, and she also comments on how calmly and humanely you present this study. <laughs> thank you. Very can difficult I, of you, ma'am. Yeah, I want to say, so the research that we do, uh, one of the areas that we that we do research on is called affective computing. So this is computing that relates to emotion. And so when I'm asked to explain like what is what is affective computing, I say it's cura personalis for computers. We're trying to teach computers how to pick up on human emotion so that they can interact better with us. Yeah. I'm sure I'm sure St. Ignatius would be very happy <laughs> <laughs> that you're making our AI uh, more practice, more cura personality. And then from Ron Cruz, again, our friend. So, do you think we will ever get to a point when we would be better at detect, when AI rather, would be better at detecting student emotions and behaviors than we as people, as teachers? Okay, this is a really interesting question, and this goes back to to, to the nature of the data that we're that we are um, using. Much of the labeling. Uh, so again, if you if you are a data science person, and if you or if you're an in, if you have an interest in it, um, you can work with data that is labeled, or you can work with data that is unlabeled. So if you work with data that's labeled, it means that there's somebody who actually tells you, okay, this is this means boredom, this means confusion, this means frustration, and so on. When you see this, the student is is angry. When you see this, the student is sad. Um, there is a, a an expert of some kind who who makes these categorizations prior to the the running of the machine learning algorithms. So the models that we create are only as good as the labels that we provide. And since it's people providing the labels, um, the best you can hope for is performance at the level of a human being. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you were to ask students. Um, so how are you feeling? How are you feeling now? You you get um, you know some people are very in touch with their emotions and other people are not. Um, some people will say I don't know, or some people will say hungry or cold, and that's not what you're getting at. <laughs> so sometimes uh, the, the 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 models that we create are really only as good as as the data that we provide. Now, if you're working with unlabeled data. Um, yes, it is possible that that your your model will produce, uh, you know, sort of 
clusters of phenomena that say, okay, these 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 behaviors seem to be very related. Uh, these other behaviors seem to be very related, and so on. Um, but what those are and how we respond to them are, are different things. Um, I think at this point of the research, um, we 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 are arriving at reasonably good models, but that's after a lot of really massaging the data and experts giving their opinions and stuff like that. Um, so maybe at some point, but I think the the way these these models are being used are um, very parang what we call soft fail, soft fail interventions. So even if they make a mistake, it shouldn't be something that will hurt the student. But do no harm. So um, it's something that maybe they can you can ask. But are you okay? Um, uh, you you seem to 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 be stuck. Do you need help? Then go on. And if they, if the student says no 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 I'm fine, then maybe you back off or something like that. Mm -hmm. So parang soft fail interventions. I think is what we're going for. Soft fail interventions. There's something new. Something new. We we have a question and a comment here coming from Mr. Ken Bonifacio, um, and he says, well, with a lot of the learning now happening online, there's a lot of data that could be gathered. So he's asking what level of expertise does do we, I guess he's referring to faculty, need in terms of computer science and of education to learn analytics. So mm -hmm. I guess he's a bit interested in doing something similar, but he's wondering what's the level of CS that he might need to start right. doing these things. Um. I guess it, much of it depends on how fancy you want to get. Because there are deeper and deeper levels of analysis. Um, you can derive, and, and actually at this point, I'm going to say, uh, Ninette de las Penas, if you'd like to chime in at any point, I am uh, I am happy to welcome your, your comments on this. Um, because so there's a there's a level of analysis you can do, which is very straightforward and possibly insightful. The manual, so like you can um, pick up the data, do some simple statistics. Sometimes you can get quite a lot of uh, of insight just by running, let's say, simple t tests or or like an ANOVA or a linear regression. Those, those you can you can get quite a lot of insight from that already. Um, but if you want to get Sort of deeper and deeper and deeper. Yun, then the level, the level of uh, expertise that you need can be quite uh, high. Also, um, I, I wanted to say the work of Meta Landron, the one on the incubation effect. Um, she the she started off with yeah, a simple um, and may uh, if you can hear me again if you if you'd like to chime in, just say so. Um, she started off, um, when, when she started her doctorate, we, we really just ran t-tests. Uh, and by the way, May, if I'm making a mistake, please let me know. <laughs> um, it, it was really just comparisons, uh, group one versus group two versus group three. Uh, so t-tests or ANOVA to, to figure out like differences between groups. So And then she started going deeper, deeper, deeper. Um, and until finally, the last analysis that she did, the last thing that she published last year, was so sophisticated that she actually won uh, uh, best overall paper in an international conference, oh. uh, an international Scopus listed conference. Um, and so we were like over the moon when when that happened. We were like, oh my gosh! And and but it was a long iterative process and. Um, May, ilang taon mo ginawa to? This was like three years in the making, correct? So, I mean, you know, it was, it was a long process. And it started with something very simple and it got just more and more sophisticated as you go along. So, maybe the short answer to the question is uh, you can start with, with a simple analysis and then just keep learning, keep going. Mm -hmm. You just build on it as you move on. Yes, along. just keep building, just keep building. And, and you know, really, um, as I, I said in the beginning, I I don't feel <clears throat> like I will not claim to be an expert because there's just you know it's you reach one level and then you find there's just so much more. <laughs> yeah. You keep just creeping up, just keep going. 
Um, and, and I guess that's what it means to be uh, con continuous learners. That's what yes. we are vital to be. Yes, true. And then, I mean, well, it's, it's, I'm so happy that we're getting a lot of questions now, but in the interest of time, we'll limit it to the last two uh, questions, right? We'll get one from Mr. Well, his name handle is Big Tito, Edsel Lorese. <laughs> so it's a bit uh, related to the question of uh, Ron earlier, but this time he's asking, can AI do assessments of students' strengths and weaknesses, all right? And at some point, might AI be better again? and human teachers in doing that. You can definitely, um, you can definitely get a sense of, uh, of strengths and weaknesses. And um, I, I'm trying to think of a simple example. Um, like for example, if you, um, uh, just going back to math, uh, if you have a problem like, uh, let's say two plus three, versus uh, five plus seven. Uh, two plus three is um, the sum is five. How is that different from five plus seven where the sum is 12? Five plus seven, there's a carry, right? Uh, you, 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 mm -hmm. The sum is over 10. So, so uh, versus two plus three, the sum is less than 10. So mm -hmm. it is possible to map out the what, what the student is going to do. So it's such that the, the the AI will will tell that okay they can the student can do sums less than ten but the moment the sums are greater than ten ah no no he he yet he has a problem already um, okay and it's um it's actually uh something that's very much rooted in oh gosh I'm gonna get this term wrong um item response theory in, in, in psychology and in um, um, so that, that you break down the the um, the subject matter into mm -hmm. specific skills that the student is supposed to learn and you have uh, you, you have a way of tracking so the AI can track which of those skills have, have been learned and uh, will students I'm oh, sorry will the AI get better at it? AI will eventually, I think, be more. I think what no no. I think what AI does is if AI can apply this consistently. Because mm -hmm. right now, the way we teach, if you have a really good teacher, the really good teacher will outperform the AI. <laughs> because the really good teacher will be able to pick up on so much more than just skills. Um, if you have a not so great teacher, then the AI will most probably outperform the, the not so good teacher. But the, the, the thing about the AI is you can deploy at scale and and that same level of consistency will be will be experienced by all the learners. Um, we can't deploy at scale in the Philippines because there are lots of other sort of infrastructure problems. But assuming that we could deploy at scale, then it's actually countries like ours that could benefit from from situation from technologies. <laughs> And then with that, ma'am, uh, sir, as a closing question, well, our sessions are now called Acts of Magic at the, at the end in the service of society. And so I'd like to echo the question of uh, Mr. Lytle, right? Asking whether these AI projects you know, will actually be applicable in public schools. Specifically, he's asking, do we have partnerships with the government? Oh. You know, um, we have tried, and like much of the data that we collect is from partner schools that are that are public schools, um, and we've always left the software with them, meaning we've installed it in their computers and we haven't uninstalled it. Um, <laughs> the problem really is that, and and these, by the way, the software that we that we use is free. It's not, uh, you know, it's not paywall. Oh, wow. It's not, yeah, these aren't licensed or anything like. That. I mean. They are legal, but they're not something like you have to pay a license for. Um, the problem really is that um, I the, the the public schools have difficulty with infrastructure, so their computers are not well maintained. Lots of viruses, um, or their their hardware when the hardware breaks down, uh, it takes a long time for for it to be repaired. So yun yung 
that's what's going on that makes it difficult to deploy at scale. Um, there's a lot more that we can offer if there was internet connectivity um, in the schools. And certainly, there are many um, organizations that would be happy to partner. And again, these are freely available. It's just that uh, if you don't have access, then you know, it's digital divide. You know? So um, that's the only problem. But yeah, I mean, you know, in, in, yeah, my, I was going to say my, my, my dream would be to, to be able to deploy something at scale uh, in the public schools. Yeah. I, I keep saying it's really us and it's really the public schools that stand to benefit the most from systems like this. And maybe we could use that also as a call, I guess, to our audience here on, on the chat and on Facebook, not how we could collaborate really and, and do um, it's clearly, at the end of the day, it's the students who will benefit from all of you. Yes. And on that note, uh, we'd like to thank you again, Ma'am Didis, for sharing all of these things. Uh, thank you. Uh, good way to end the, the work week, in a sense. It is a holiday tomorrow, but then all these seem to be the same. But at this point, I'd like to take the opportunity <laughs> to plug all right, no, uh, this book. Well, I hope the, I hope our audience can see it. Common courtesy online. All right. It's part of a series uh, of books that Ma'am Dina herself uh, wrote alongside with her husband and collaborated with several artists. All right. And I'd like to highlight this book in particular because, well, with all the online learning that will be happening for uh, adaptive design learning, as Atene would put it, it's a good and quick cute way of reminding our children, especially the younger children, on how to navigate the online world. Uh, Ma'am, I know this was published by Bookmark, but how might people be able to purchase this book along with the other titles? Just really? Right. Uh, you can go to the Bookmark, uh, Bookmark the Filipino Bookstore website. Um, it yes. is uh, it is literally Bookmark, bookmark Filipino Bookstore yes. <laughs> com. And uh, they they do take online orders, so thank you for plugging, Chris. Yeah. Put this on. Yeah, so at least uh, pwede pa rin po order online. Yes. Uh, you don't have to leave. Okay. And we'd also like to, again, of course, thank the University Research Council and Ateneo Research Institute of Science and Engineering for putting together this talk and inviting Dr. Edith Petito to be with us this afternoon. All right. Any last words, ma'am, Edith? I wanted to say thank you to 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 Len, to Nanette, to Winfer, to you for hosting. Thank you, Marlu as well, and Andre, uh, and um, and uh, the office of Matek uh, for for being so supportive in this. Thank you also to all the people who collaborated with me because um, you know the work is is really collaborative. I mean, it, it's the work of all my students. Um, and uh, who, have, who have graduated, and many of whom are my colleagues now. So I'm very grateful to them for, for making all this possible. Thank you, Ma'am Divya. If, if the audience is uh, interested to know more about the work of Ma'am Divya and also of our previous guests, again, all of their works are available, uh, or they are available at the artium.ateneo.edu. Right? And you can find their various research works there. So thank you, Ma'am Davis. Thank you very much to all our audience. Uh, my name is Chris Castillo, and this is Acts of Magic, Athenians in the Service of Society. Good evening. Take care.